Are you stuck at home in lockdown? Yeah, I know, we all are. Don't worry, we've got you covered, because it's time once again for Live at Night with Pete Ferrero, where whatever happens, happens. Here is your host, Pete Ferrero. They must be like the life of the party. You <laughs> Okay, here we are. This is exciting. This is uh, a few weeks later, but uh, we are here with Sam Cutler and Deborah. Uh, how's everything going, you guys? I mean, Deborah, l- talk to me about what's going on in your world. Um, how has quarantine been for you? Actually, quarantine for me has been fine because we have we have a big house. Sam's been to our place, so he knows what it's what I'm talking about. We've got. We're back from the street a long way. I have a big garden. I have raised beds. I'm planting. I have lettuce and tomatoes and whatnot. So I can get out in the garden. And that's fabulous. And when we need to go out, when we have cabin fever, we climb into Nick's big Subaru out back and we just drive. And, and that way we're completely contained. Um, the only downside of all this, of course, is we have a second CD coming out. The Sound Hill second CD is in, in final mastering and mixing. Oh, yeah, let's go do a live show somewhere. Not on this planet. There's nowhere. <laughs> right. Else. Yeah. So you know, it'll we'll do we'll do an online we'll 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 do a, a kickoff show just the three of us and broadcast it and do something and do That's that. Cool. But yeah, lots of music, lots of playing my ouds, playing my guitars, playing my bagua massage, and just writing lyrics and poetry and stuff. Now, Sam, you're not in America. You're in you're, you're in Sydney, yeah. Australia, right? Uh, What's yeah. quarantine like? Talk about how it's different there than it is here. We were just talking a little well, bit. I mean, I, I, I mean, I only know, you know, anecdotally what it's like in America. I mean, I think difference. I, I think it's the same the whole world over. You know, it's the rich what gets the pleasure. It's the poor that gets the blame. It's the same the whole world over. Ain't it all a bleeding shame? I mean, we're locked in our houses either, you know, by, um, you know, acquiescence or, I mean, in, in in Melbourne right now here, we've got a secondary outbreak. They're actually, people are in prison in tower blocks, you know, in, hmm. um, <coughs> in government housing, you know. <coughs> a shocking situation for them. Uh, and I'm have my doubts about it, but the government insists that that's the way for dealing with it. We've been very fortunate in that the government, miraculously, because I'm not a great supporter of the Australian government, uh, jumped on the situation very early. People went for it. People isolated very early. So we've had very, you know, relatively speaking, very few deaths. I mean, Mm. I would say this about the whole coronavirus thing. I think Broadly speaking, this is a crash generalization, but what can we do but generalize? Um, you know, the people that are most at risk from this are people like me who have pre existing conditions, yeah. 77 years old, basically half buggered, if not totally buggered, you know what I mean, on the way out the door anyway. So we're vulnerable. So there's a big debate that's yet to be had because we're in the midst of all this but I think the debate that will come about the coronavirus is this, is whether one should protect the the vulnerable pay extra attention to them and protect them as best we can, right? And, um, And allow the herd, as it were, the mass of people to get it. Of course if you look at the figures, you know, although millions of people, you know have, have suffered from the coronavirus millions of people haven't died from it so right. not everyone dies from it but the nonetheless there are experiments going on and this all seems to me in many ways to be a vast experiment sweden for example has oh, the same Don't hey, go down. Deborah, can i say something let me say what i'm here saying. we go <laughs> You know what I mean? You're, you can say what you're going to say. I'll say what I'm going to say. Thank you. There are different ways of approaching this. No one way is necessarily the correct way. Already, the virus that we're dealing with is mutating and becoming something else. Different uh, groups of uh, the human race are being um, affected by it. So I'm not sure that any one way is necessarily the correct way. All I can say is that the the difference between Australia and America is quite patently obvious if one looks at the figures. 
the crisis in a crisis in America, at least in if it's measured in terms of deaths, is infinitely greater than it seems to be in Australia. But this could all be somewhat illusionary, you know. Sure. I, um, I've lost my foster brother to it. He died. He was only 61. You know, he wasn't an old man. He was fit and he was healthy. We were, nobody could be more surprised than uh, me and the rest of the family that that happened. Uh, I've lost half a dozen friends around the world to it. So, you know, I also yesterday, just on a site, we're on Facebook, so I'll say this, right? Yesterday, for the first time, I decided I would go through my Facebook friends list, and I've been on Facebook eight or nine years, and delete people that I know knew, known had died, right? Yeah. So I, and I counted the number of people while I did it. So that was 127 people. Wow. So, yeah, people die from God knows what, you know, all kinds of stuff, and uh, I'm going to die. Everyone's going to die. That's the one thing that puts us all together. Um so, you know, we do the, uh, the the best we can, like America is. I've got lots of dear friends in America who are doing the best they can and lots of people in America who don't happen to be friends of mine, but it seems that there are lots of people in America who are refusing to take this seriously. Yeah. So, serious. so here we are. We're lucky to be in Amer in uh, Australia. We're lucky to be in America. We sure. all, each, each group of people you know, deals with it. It's a, it's a bit like some people like fish, some people like the Grateful Dead, some people can't stand either of them. Uh, some <laughs> sure. people only love the Rolling Stones. Who knows? You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. It's almost like a subjective thing, isn't it? Anyway, I'll shut up. I didn't real, mean to. Real, real quick, so in terms of the coronavirus, and we're going to get into this, this would be yeah. a good one. What, what's what's scarier, the, the coronavirus or Altamont? <laughs> ha, ha. <laughs> well, I I wasn't particularly scared of Altamont. There you go. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, Altamont is simple, and it's like the coronavirus in this respect. It absolutely depended where you were in mm. that site. Lots of people for years have said to me, man, I don't know what all the fucking fuss was about, man. I was on the hill. We had a good time. We were all cool. We could, all we could see was the music kept stopping. And there was some kind of bullshit going on down the front. We were miles away. We we're up on the hill. Everything was cool. Yeah. So it depended where you were. And the perspective. Life, yeah. Isn't, yeah. Isn't that isn't that life in a nutshell? It fucking depends where you are, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you're totally up on the hill, it can be cool. If you're down in the valley, you might have the floods and God knows what else going on. You know. Absolutely, I mean? man. Wait. So, so, so before you come. Uh, you were talking about, sorry, Deborah. Before we came on, we were talking a little bit about uh, how you came into this Stones world. That was in '68. You started hanging around them. How does that happen for you? Well, I mean, I think London, there was a time in London when London was a little bit like San Francisco. You know, everybody knew everybody. Uh, the musicians and people in the business all went to the same clubs, you know, and hung out together. Uh, there was a great. Um, yeah, I mean, to call it a sense of camaraderie might be a little bit too kind of strong, but in a sense it was, you know. The, uh, London had its little kind of quiet summer of love, if you like, you know what I mean? Um, and there was a kind of underground scene in London, so people knew one another and, uh, the, you know, the drugs were the great uh, bringer together of everybody, so... Uh, if you didn't know people because you knew them through the music business, you knew them because, you know, they smoked good hash or they had access to good hash. Everyone in England, everyone in England in the London scene smoked hashish, not yeah. marijuana. Marijuana doesn't really grow in England very well because, you know, England's cold and wet. You know what I mean? It's so, uh, yeah, it didn't, uh, it wasn't a big thing in England, pot, but uh, hash was. And I mean, hash in England goes back three, four hundred years. I mean, don't forget that India used to be part of the British Empire, you know, so um, it, the Brits are well aware of Ash. So a certain kind of demimond bohemian group have always enjoyed hashish, you know, and the smoking hashish, and uh, the Stones were part of that group, just like the Pink Floyd were or any other band you, that you could mention from about 1963 onwards. Um, <coughs> you know, um so, yeah, I used to meet people at parties and uh, and then Alexis, the way I became 
uh, eventually involved with the Stones was the Alexis Corner was a good friend of mine. And yeah. uh, Mick, Mick and uh, Keith and people like that went to see Alexis Corner because Alexis was a kind of, you know, sometimes called the father of the British blues scene, which is a bit strong. But, you know, he was certainly ahead of the game and was yeah. somebody really into And he was actually Greek of all people, you know, but he lived in London and was very sophisticated and had this wonderful kind of deep uh, brown kind of voice that uh, was perfect for advertising. So he used to do uh, voiceovers, you know, for like soap flakes and shit like that on television for the first TV ads. So he made plenty of money from that and that allowed him to follow what he really loved doing, which was playing music. Then in actual fact, I got my first ever job as a tour manager was with uh, Alexis. I went on tour with him, which, which basically meant start and carry one of his guitars because he had two guitars on tour. So he used to have one himself and one hand free and I'd have the other one and one hand free and that's how we managed kind of thing. But um, it was all very, you know, nip and tuck. It wasn't uh, wealthy. But anyway, he... What year was that? Yeah, he started. That he started the. That was in the sorry. Because uh, just because I know, yeah, you know, Nikki played with him a lot. I mean, is he? Who was? Oh really yeah, on and off. Nikki played with him. Yeah, for sure. 64, yeah. 65, around right. there. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so who, how do you become the, I mean, obviously now you're connected with them, you're seeing them at parties, and who connects you to be the road manager? How does that conversation happen? Well, we must make a distinction here, dear boy. Okay. <laughs> road managers lift things. Tour managers tell road managers where to put things. Love it. The difference, you know. Yeah. Um, you become a tour manager because basically, you know, with the best will in the world, bands need looking after Someone's got to do it, and that person has to be reliable. I mean, of course, there's been many people that have been uh, tour managers who aren't very reliable. But one of the things about being a tour manager, at least when I first started, was, you know, you know, you couldn't be in a heroin and you couldn't be in an alcohol, both of which really don't work with being a tour manager. The tour manager, you know, can't be uh, – when someone say, where's the tour manager? He can't be the guy that's lying over there on the floor. <laughs> you know, yeah, you have to kind of be the the uh, you know a kind of you have to have the head head the the the, the mindset of being well I'm going to be the fucking last man standing here regardless you know and I often have been you know I mean and you also have to be somebody that's uh, you know you can't people constantly ask tour managers stupid questions especially musicians like. Where where are we tomorrow? Or <laughs> where are we now? Or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? Whatever question you can think of uh, somebody asking you will be asked. Right. So if you're, if you're the kind of person that wants to go, why don't you fuck off and leave me alone? Don't be a tour manager. You know what I mean? Um, now nowadays I would tell people, fuck you. I'm you know I ain't going to answer your questions. Go away. Leave me alone. But there was a certain period in my life where I thought, you know, that helping people like the Rolling Stones, the Grateful Dead and the band and people like that was, you know, my contribution to civilised existence that I needed to make. It was my karma, whatever you want to say. Sure. I think it was absolutely the most fundamental and important thing in my life. So I did it with, you know, the best heart I could bring to uh, bring to the party, you know what I mean? And, and the best energy that I could muster. But it's not something, you know, that, you know, that one can do for the, you know, well, I couldn't anyway. I mean, I did it for a few years and then it was like, well, fuck this for a game of soldiers. It was like, what do you, what, I mean, I asked myself, as it were, with a kind of bifurcated two-person conversation, I asked myself, well, what do you really want to do? I mean, you know, it wasn't my fantasy ever to be a rock and roll star. Right. I play guitar, fuck around on it, but I don't call myself a guitarist. I don't want to be a rock and roll star. I never did want to be. But, uh, you know, so I spent a lot, a, a large section of my life, maybe, you know, the most dynamic and kind of, you know, youthful period of my life, being concerned with other people's fantasies mm. and helping them come true. And then it was like, well, what's your fantasy, Sam? What do you want to do? So I, you know, in 1978, uh, I left for India. I just fucked up and said, well, I think it's my time to be a hippie. 
I'm going to go to India and just relax, you know, and uh, discover the meaning of life and look at my own navel, whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I did that late, you know, where most of my friends had gone in the middle of the 60s, had gone to India and were, you know, discovered Goa and all that stuff. I was, a, uh, I, I went briefly, yeah, I was there in 60, 67 for like three weeks. But I was like a tourist, you know what I mean? Right. This time I went for three years. And yep. uh, I decided that really, basically, I didn't want to do anything. Mm. You know, when people were asking me, what do you do? I'd say, well, to tell you the truth, I've done enough already. There's nothing <laughs> I really want to do. I want to sit around. I want to daydream. And uh, I'll write about it. So that's what I've been doing for nearly 40 years, you know, and um, I'm also the world's laziest writer. I don't, you know, beat myself up and go, I've got to write 2,000 words a day, whatever. Right. I, you know, I'm actually in the middle of a, a second part memoir of a memoir. I'm writing a book that's got 700,000 words so far, which is basically the words of my cat. It's like a, a look at the human race from the perspective of, of the cat. Brilliant. I can't wait to read that. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's called The Book of Max. So that's really basically needs editing rather than writing. The major part of the writing's done. And other than that, I live alone with a, a thousand books and a cat. My girlfriend, uh, bless her, is stuck in fucking Japan. So how is the coronavirus for me? I'm horny as a snake. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's the nice, oh, nice thing about isolating with my with my husband of 37 years and my bass player of 43. Right. Yeah. There you yeah. go. There you go. Uh, you you see? Together yeah. and Debra, you can have musician sandwiches. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my one's well, uh, <laughs> She's stuck. Um, it's like, hi, Miu. I think about you, darling. She's stuck looking after her grandmother who's oh. senile, the poor old thing, and she went back to J to um, Japan just to see her for a bit and got stuck there. Boom. Um, and may I just say to all my friends who are listening, to this, all millions of you out there, hello, everyone. Thanks for ch tuning in to Pete here. We were supposed to do this before, but it was on a day of... of um, national protest basically yeah. in uh, in america uh, 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 around the black lives matter movement something of which i'm i'm a, a, a fond believer and supporter of and i think we're in a uh, angela davis a very wonderful woman and a black uh, activist um, in america said something which struck me as being very uh, very profound actually it was that, that you know up to now up to you know uh, uh, a, a month ago, maybe even, um, the whole Black Lives Matter movement, the whole movement for the, just the continuing liberation of the, the poor people of colour in, in, uh, in the world, let alone mm. the United States, was basically black people, you know, uh, bemoaning their fate and trying to do something about it on their own. But this has changed now, and that the... the the Black Lives Matter has become much more than just uh, people of colour um, protesting. In fact, the bridges have been built between the progressive elements of, of, uh, of uh, the Anglo-Saxon society, if you like to call it that, or whatever, the Anglo, the white society, whatever you... Black and white together are saying enough is enough. Yeah. And that's, that's been a bit strange. Yeah. Here, yeah. here, you've had it was always, you know, in Australia, which has got a terrible problem with racism. It really does. And, and the black people in Australia uh, are treated just as badly, if not worse, in fact, than uh, the people in, Amer in America. Mm. Uh, uh, here, it's definitely changed. And there were now thousands of white people supporting the Aboriginal people's uh, protest, which hadn't hasn't happened before. So it's... Uh, it's a welcome development, you know, yeah. and uh, there's a long way to go, of course, because, you know, marching in the streets is a, definitely a necessary part of political activism. But, you know, in the end, it all needs to be converted into, you know, power and power. Sure. Show up and vote. 
please. Sure. Yeah. All right, a couple of people here are saying hi to you. Sam, uh, Sam's yeah. book, Michael Watson says, Sam's book is an excellent read. Thank you, Michael. I'm glad to know somebody in America reads books. Hey. And oh, Andrew, right. Andrew's ready for some oh, uh, Rolling Stone chat. So, uh, okay, let's talk to the Rolling Stones. Yeah, let's talk about let's talk let's let's go back in time to 1969. This right. is what we're gonna dive into today. Um, right. I want to ask you. You weren't man. You weren't the manager at the time, but you were around the circle when Brian Jones is inevitably fired from the Stones. Yeah. So do you know that that's coming? Are you around that circle or is it a shock to everybody? And what is that experience like for, for you and uh, what you know of it? I mean, I think the, gen the general attitude to Brian in, in you know, in, in those that were in the know in, uh, in, um, in England was that the situation was un unsustainable. He was being merciless, mercilessly persecuted by the cops. He was a completely over-the-top, irrational kind of lifestyle, you know, hiding from people and having his apartment where he lived constantly being busted. But apart from all that, he – Brian was one of those people, you know, when everyone took a trip, right, Brian would have to take three. <laughs> you know those kind of people? You yeah. know what I mean? It was kind of bizarre kind of approach to it all where – he was bigger and better and had to take more than anybody else. So his drug intake was alarmingly disproportionate when put against his kind of ability to deal with it. Some people can take shitloads of drugs and it doesn't seem to have, you know, too bad an effect on him. Given his being persecuted by the cops and given the fact that Mick and Keith were sick to death of him, you know, because... Mm -hmm. Start Brian didn't write any songs, not that we know of anyway. He was a brilliant musician individually, but that kind of went out of the window as his, you know, desire and, and, and passion for it all kind of waned. So his musical skills tended to wane, you know, and the contribution that he made waned. And the fact that he was getting busted all the time made, made, um, touring impossible i mean when i joined the rolling stones the rolling stones had done fuck all except the um circus thing you know which <laughs> was the circus uh for three years they were desperate to play you know it, it, it although they don't play that often the rolling stones are essentially like the grateful dead a live band that's yeah. where they shine you know that's where the guys get off doing that they hadn't done it for three years. They desperately needed to do it in order to satisfy the demands of the record company, the demands of the friend, their fans, their their own egos. But just that the sheer, you know, heroin of performance, if you like, if I might use a, a strange phrase, you know, the, the, that that touches, you know, the parts that other things can't reach. So they needed to play, man. And uh, the uh, the demise of Brian was such that in the end, they had to, you know, had to make some hard choices. And Brian basically fucked up with the Rolling Stones. He didn't handle it very well. Brian was one of those people who didn't handle anything very well, except playing an instrument when he was called upon to do it. But, you know, for a certain few magic years in his life, he was very special with that. But in terms of handling people, he was dreadful. And I mean, like, the Rolling Stones started out, you know, they couldn't even get a fucking gig because their air was too long and all that. And they finally, you know, got got going and, and everyone loved them and there were riots and all that shit, you know what I mean? But Brian, you know, uh, who was the leader of the band, took more money than anybody else. Hmm. That, you know, is the kiss of death in a band, mm -hmm. you know? What would you mm -hmm. think? Hey, we're all in this together, brother, except I get more than you do. Right. You know, that caused, I think, a lasting resentment in the band. That, that they never quite, certainly not Mick and Keith, they never quite got over that. So I think Mick and Keith had wanted, as soon as Brian start, stopped making really magic um, 
contributions on on a musical level, um, that meant that Keith, for example, had to uh, become much more of a musician, not just a rhythm guitar player, but really had to step up. He had to do things. It meant that they used other people, you know, from Nicky Hopkins to uh, um, to other guitar players, all kinds of people. Right, Cooter. The substitutes, yeah, Ray came and played, you know. Um, the Rolling Stones, there's a great um, saying, you know, talent borrows, genius steals. Mm-hmm. You know, and... Uh, the Rolling Stones stole from everybody. Yeah, and their their music is a, an amalgam of other other people's music in a sense, you know, which they finally morphed into their own kind of style and their own inimical sure. thing. But Brian's contribution waned, and they needed somebody young and enthusiastic who could really play, which is what Brian used to be, you know, in the in the early sixties, and. Uh, or in the mid sixties, I should say. So along came Mick Taylor, who was fantastic, you know. Well, there he is, right? There, there he is. is. Nineteen sixty nine at Hyde Park. Yeah, I love Mick Taylor. Obviously, I think everybody's commenting on him already. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, so what is your introduce introduction like to Mick Taylor? Well, I met him. You know what I mean. And, and English people meet one another. We we tend to be very uh, reserved people. The English. Mm-hmm. Even me, although I haven't lived in England for I don't know 150,000 years. Um, Mick was he's lovely, very shy, very quiet, very pretty, you know, kind of beautiful English rocker, you know, with typical handsome kind of pretty guy. I not handsome, pretty, I'd call him pretty rather than handsome. So, uh, Mick has that kind of androgynous kind of ACDC thing to him loved him you know what i mean but he could play man he could play and he's very reserved and shy and and uh, i found you know I found he the rolling stones have always been very easy to work for if you work <laughs> to a manager for the rolling stones everything's very pleased and thank you we're very civilized people you know it's not a not a, a brutal environment whatsoever and of course, you know, if you if you work for people, I anyway, if I ever work for people, I work for them because I love them. I love their music. So if you love people, you know, you work twenty four hours a day. It's not work. It's a it's a joy, you know, to sure. help people do what they're doing. So Mick was, uh, you know, he was a new boy on the block, and joining the Rolling Stones is is um, as a musician, of course, is something else, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's daunting. It's daunting. But the Rolling Stones were. My take on it with him was they were especially Keith and Charlie, everybody was super, super um supportive, you know. Yeah. Encourage him, you know, get the best out of him, you know what I mean? So they announced Hyde Park, right? And you're gonna be in, you're gonna be involved in, in well, Hyde yeah, Park. I, yeah, I, they came they came to um Mick and Marianne. I was a friend of Marianne since I was sixteen. I've known Marianne. My parents knew her father, da 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 da, da all that stuff. Uh, we knew each one, one another from way back. Uh, Mick and Marianne came to the Blind Faith concert in Hyde Park, and there were 150,000 people at it. And Mick was very curious about it, you know, how it was organized, what the deal was, all that shit, you know what I mean? The, right. the nuts and bolts of it all. So we talked there, and that's when he began to think, we should do this. That we should do a show in Hyde, Hyde Park. Park show, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and that use that as the introduction of our new guitar player. And the Stones, you know, needed to play, man. You know what I mean? They needed to play in front of people. They knew they got fucking hundreds of thousands of fans in England. No one had seen them. Yeah, so, no one. yeah, yeah. So Mick's idea, Mick was a Mick's a clever guy. You know, Mick's idea was we'll do a show, and. Uh, We'll get basically we'll get um, uh, Granada, which was a London television production company, to put the cost up for the show. You know, to build a decent stage, etc., etc., etc. So I did all that. You know, that legwork. I designed the stage. I got it built, and then we put together a sound system. You know, so a quarter of a million people could hear it. You know, which was unprecedented. All these things were. If you look at the. The Blind Face show, they played on a, a stage which is in, was embarrassingly small. Right. You know, tiny little stage. The Stones played on an aircraft carrier of a stage. Right. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. 
huge, right? You know, and uh, yeah, that you know, the, the the music business makes progress by small incremental steps. Yeah, sure. So we learn, you know. You saw we a lot learn. happening in that time period too, where things yeah. were changing very quickly. You know. Well, one of the things we learned was if you want to build a stage that, that's um, able to be secured. It's got to be at least six foot off the ground, preferably nine or ten feet off the ground. If you've got, you know, half a million people that want to see what's happening on it, mm. you know, if it's high enough up in the air, no one can get on it. And that was one of the basic problems of Altamont. Right. The problem with Altamont was the, the stage was knee high, literally. Let's save. Let's let's get let's get to let's get to Ultima. <laughs> okay, Dave Chambers asks a good question. Yeah. Did Mick Taylor, I guess that's who he's talking about, know he had the full time gig at Hyde Park? Did he know he was going to be the new guitar player, or was did he think he was just kind of trying out? Oh no, no, he knew. He knew yeah. they'd uh, they'd already had rehearsals. Right. Oh, you can't just go on stage and start playing. I mean, the Great for Dead yeah. can. You know what I mean? But he, the Grateful Dead, the only reason the Grateful Dead can do that is because they played together every day for fucking 95 years. Right. You, know what I mean? yeah. you play together and need to know, oh, well, under my thumb is in this key and so and so is in that key or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you kind of need to know these things beforehand. So they played it. Yeah. No, Mick was a, he was a, he'd already been introduced to the press prior mm. to that to week. And they'd had photographs of him sitting on the grass with the Rolling Stones or that stuff. Very yeah, cool. yeah, he knew. Now, yeah. as we're building to Hyde Park, Brian Jones dies, right? Yes, indeed. So what is that experience like from your end and for the band at that point? Because I know that's a lot of rumor and innuendo and speculation about what happened with Brian. Um, there's what a, there's really happened? There's a, film, well, there's a film about Brian Jones, which... Um, Danny Garcia made, which is great. There's a great film about it that's out now that you can go online and look at, um, which tells, you know, 60% of the story. There's all kinds of legal reasons why stuff can't be said. But the fact of the matter is, Brian was murdered. There's no question about it. The autopsy report showed that Brian died with fresh water in his lungs, right? Mm. He didn't drown in a swimming pool. If he drowned in a swimming pool, he would have had chlorinated water in his lungs. He didn't drown in a swimming pool. Right. There's also, uh, also there are photographs of Brian in the morgue. Right? I can't really go. It, some of this I can't really say any more than I'm saying. But there mm. are photographs of his body in the morgue with bruises on his face. You don't get bruises on your face from drowning. There's a, right. There's, right. The problem with Brian's death was that one of the people who worked for the Rolling Stones, who should be nameless, right, had a, and who was working for Brian, right, so you can put one and one together and make nine, right, mm -hmm. had a brother who was a senior police officer at Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard is like, you know, the FBI, if you like, sure. the, the British police, right? And so they... They basically put the kibosh on any kind of real investigation. But something that everyone should try and think about here and remember about Brian's death is this. Nobody sympathized with Brian. Mm. The only people that sympathized with Brian were the people who loved the Rolling Stones, who, believe me, in 1969 were a small minority of the population of Great Britain, and just about 50% of them, if not more, came to the show in Hyde Park as a sign of, you know, support for Brian. The aristocracy in Britain, the middle classes, the kind of people like Brian's father, right, mm. that all basically thought that Brian deserved it. And working class people thought he was just a, you know, this weird kind of, kind of regency pimp who knows what they thought about him but nobody really sympathized with the way he was you know brian was sure. way, way ahead of his time so the newspapers basically presented it all as oh well you know if you behave like some regency fop you know what i mean and you take drugs this is what happens to you look at that isn't this you know this is like karma isn't it you know uh, 
multi-millionaire rock star drowns in, in his own swimming pool. Of course, serves him bloody right, behaving yeah. like fucking disgraceful. You know what I mean? That's what they said in the clubs and pubs of England. So there was no natural sympathy for him. Like, say, if you take the death of Prince, for example, sure. America, as an example, you know what I mean? You, I think you could say, broadly speaking, there was a lot of sympathy for, for Prince. Yes, well people loved. Were, yeah. Well loved and people were horrified by it, right? Yes, definitely. I, I, don't, I think you could count on, you know, on 20 people's hands, the number of people who were genuinely, genuinely horrified by what happened to Brian. Yeah. The Rolling Stones themselves, I, <clears throat> I don't think they knew, really. I mean, I was there in their office when it happened, you know what I mean? So Mick was in the office the day after they'd found out about it at the, at the, at the, um, at the uh, uh, recording studio. And, yeah. I mean, it's not an exaggeration to say they were terribly upset. You know what I mean? Ter terribly so. And, and there was, you know, a considerable debate about, you know, how to handle it, what they should do. But, I mean, the, in the best kind of traditions of show business, the, the first thing was like, well, we've got to carry on here. Show must go on, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a show in Hyde Park. Let's turn it into a memorial for Brian. And, uh, which was which was what happened, and of course there was a, a massive outpouring of sympathy for Brian and for the Rolling Stones, basically because people were everybody that smoked hash, all the young people were sick to fucking death of the British cops, you know, who persecuted the Rolling Stones, persecuted kids for smoking hash, which the fucking aristocracy of Britain have been done it, doing for 300 years, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know, oh, no, we couldn't have working-class people getting high. You're supposed to be a fucking wage slave enjoying life. You know what I mean? Typical British fucking upper-class trip. So the police were just the stormtroopers of the British establishment trying to control what young people should do. And rock and roll, you know, was, you know, tantamount to the devil. And so yeah. rock and roll was a, this insidious influence on young people that should be smashed and crushed in every single way possible, which is still what's going on in America, you know, oh. as innocuous and harmless as pot smoking. We still have whole police departments, you know, that, you know, uh, spending all their resources and energy on putting people in jail for bullshit, right, when real crime isn't addressed, you know, uh, yeah. and it's just, you know, it's just ridiculous. So people were, were very, very sympathetic. People, when I say people, I mean young people. Fans. fans not of my, not yeah. my mother. Right. My, right. Mother, my mother's attitude was, well, he did drugs. He deserved it. That was exactly what my mother said. He did drugs. He deserved to die. Right. Mm. Hello. You know what I mean? And my mother was a was a communist. She was very left wing and progressive, but you know had the the most reactionary attitude. You know when it came to drugs because she'd been uh, you know brainwashed like the rest of the fucking world. Yeah. Well, if you do drugs, well, you deserve to drown in your own swimming pool. Wonderful. Got it. <laughs> hey, hey, Deborah, you said you before we came on. You said that you had met Brian, right? I had, you know, I wanted to ask Sam about this, but he's actually already answered the question earlier. Oh, okay, on. sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was just, it was this, it was, it was one of those bizarre little random cosmic things that happened. Nothing yeah. to do with music, nothing to do with rock and roll. It was January of because I was still thirteen. It was January of um, nineteen sixty-seven. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, Deborah is. No, 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 no. There was no, nothing like get your mind out of the bedroom. It didn't go there. Nothing like that. <laughs> I was, however, on my way to meet somebody that I probably was not supposed to be going to meet, and I was dressed up. I was dressed up in my little mini skirt, and the thing is, I had a pair of really expensive Mary Quant style Carnaby Street because we yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, get the bright, bright red tights. January, icy cold, New York City. Windy as fuck. I've got my head down because I'm I, just like, wow, walking into a wind, and I cannon off a little guy 
and he staggers because he had his head down. We turned into a Gary Larson moment. The sound of their heads colliding secretly delighted the onlookers. He staggered and didn't fall. I did, went down on my knees, scraped both knees, but more to the point, tore my shiny, bright, red new tights. And I got up and knew Sam knows me. And I was like, what's up, you watch where you're going, guys? I was this little guy, you know, like, I just was like, yeah. Uh, he was a sweetheart. He said, I'm so sorry. You've ruined your tights, I've ruined your tights. And where can we buy you new tights? And I was like, what? Uh, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> What he, what he said was, I have no idea what, and, and it was, I didn't know who he was. He was familiar. Was the right. thing. This, this, is what, this is what but he I said. Finish, so. We went to Bloomingdale's. He bought me a new pair of tights. He said, I hope I haven't made you late. And he was clearly going somewhere. He was by himself. Interesting. He did not want to be noticed. Yeah, and I was like, Thank you. Fine. I got to go. I was like, what have I seen him before? No, I've seen him before. And then I was like, the next night, I think it was like, oh, look, it's the Ed Sullivan show. Oh, wow. There's right. fucking Rolling Stones. And I went, that's why he's here. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> You're running. So many dark stories. No, I mean, my, no, no Englishman would ever call a woman's underwear touch. What he should he say? Yeah, no, dog. I've torn your knickers. No, 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 not Maybe by I'm, just, I'm just, just teasing you. Yeah. I'm just teasing. You know, I just, the thing is, is that Sam, this is this was for me. This has been a dichotomy for years because so much dark shit came out about him. The the the, the memory in my head is not of that encounter where I met a, a very apologetic little man who mm. replaced what he had caused damage to, and we both went on our separate ways. Just a nice little encounter. I would yeah, not yeah, remember. Got, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, right. but that's just that, one that, song. That lasting picture in my head is not of that encounter, Sam. It's of him in that Nazi uniform with Anita Pallenberg. So it's been a dichotomy. You've already answered that question for me, though. There really yeah. was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde aspect to him. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan was a nasty piece of work. Let's get I, it straight. Oh, I gather. So you got him on a good day. But, you, you know, go. Ryan was a volatile yeah. artist, uh, in, and who knows, you know. He couldn't handle drugs. He couldn't handle drink. And when he was on either, he was a pain in the ass. That's the reality. And if yeah. you, you know, wanted to have a band with a guy like that, it was a pain in the ass trying to incorporate him into what you were doing. So whilst he was wonderful, uh, uh, you know, at times on his uh, on his uh, instruments and all that, he was yeah. great. As soon well, as that, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying he was great. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got you, I've got you, Deborah. Yeah, that's why. Right. Would, why would you put up with Brian Jones? Huh? The Rolling Stones got fucking fed up with him, and yeah. I don't blame them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. And that's what happened. Now, it's interesting, though. This I Hyde Park show is, I think, last yesterday, it's what? How many years since Hyde Park 1969? It's July 5th, 1969, I think. So we're right, almost right on the anniversary of that weekend. When you look back on Hyde Park, Sam, uh, do you have good memories of that show? Sure. Everybody does. It was a great day. Yeah. I mean, the music was dreadful. So what? It wasn't just about the music. It was more about showing solidarity with Brian Jones and the Rolling Stones and making a statement about the persecution of the Rolling Stones and young people in general by the police. There were no police at that show. The police deliberately didn't show up at the show believing that if they didn't show up, that it would be chaotic and that no one would behave themselves. And you know what I mean? And then they could point, you know, to this, uh, the dreadful behavior of these young people. But in fact, everyone behaved impeccably. Right. And I think there was, there was two old ladies from the uh, St. John's Ambulance uh, Brigade who dealt with the, um, the, the health issues as they came up. I think one person got sunstroke. Um, and uh, they, you know, made cups of tea and gave people cups of tea and biscuits. Nobody got injured. Um, no babies were born. Nobody was killed. Um, it was a lovely day. Everyone was stoned and uh, enjoyed themselves, you know. And as I say, there was that symbolic thing of, you know, supporting the stones and showing yeah. that, that, you know, this was an important moment for the counterculture in England. 
Now and they go on tour, right? They go to Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. You're a part of all of the different dates and whatnot that they're that all, all the places that they're they're going to. How is the tour? Is it easy to manage in 1969? I mean, like you said earlier, kind of you know things are changing. We're putting you know big speakers up in in these well, arenas. The, and yeah, it changed. It changed. I mean, the, the, that tour was quite dramatically different to other tours by other bands. One of the things that happened on that tour, for example, was that the band travelled, courtesy of Chipmunk and credit where credit's due. Chip did this. Um, Chipmunk uh, uh, sorted out the technical end of the tour. So the band travelled and the same sound system and fallback system was uh, uh, at each gig. This was completely a new experience. What most people did uh, in rock and roll terms in those days was play in, uh, you know, converted cinemas or whatever and play through whatever sound system happened to be there, usually dreadful, and, they, you know, they couldn't hear themselves anyway. I mean, Bill Wyman told me that the Rolling Stones used to play in cinemas and, it, you know, the gigs had last, or, or small or smaller auditoriums, the gig had last 15, 20 minutes. There'd be a huge riot, and that was the end of it. Nobody listened. You know, the girls all screamed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This tour was totally different insofar as, and it freaked out the Rolling Stones to begin with. People would actually listen to their music. So the the first gig uh, the Rolling Stones did was woefully untogether. It was shit. And, um, in fact, I I... We were going to that gig in Colorado, if I remember, yeah. And um, and uh, we're flying to the gig. They suddenly realized they, that everything was together and all that, but they didn't have uh, anyone to introduce the band. So Mick said, oh, oh, Sam will do it. You'll do it, won't you, Sam? I said, yeah, sure. I don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? I'll do it. Right. No and then it was like, oh, what am I going to say? And I, you know, in the midst of doing everything else, I didn't re- re- really even think about it, except for, you know, like, two seconds before everybody was ready to go on stage and I had to run out there and say something. So I ran out going, yeah, the greatest rock and roll band in the world, the Rolling Stones, blah, 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 blah. Everyone went fucking nuts. The band played. It was dreadful, but nobody gave a fuck anyway. Right. So Mick came off and, they, and I used to be on the side of the stage, you know, rescuing young girls from Mick and all that shit, you know, as they jumped up on stage or whatever. And he said, I want to talk to you. And we went in the dressing room on our own. And he looked at me and said, you know, really angry. He goes, for fuck's sake, man, don't introduce the band like that. No, it's embarrassing, the greatest rock and roll band in the world. Please, you know. And I looked at him and said, well, either you fucking are or you ain't. You know what I mean? And one thing for fucking sure, you weren't the greatest rock and roll band in the world tonight, were you? (laughs) <laughs> right which he you know absolutely agreed so the next thing they did was they went into rehearsal for two weeks and they got the got the uh, set of um they shoot horses don't they that film so it still had like a chinese lanterns and everything hanging on the warner brother in warner brothers uh, out at burbank fucking huge thing set up the whole stage and uh yeah they did a what the Rolling Stones call rehearsals. So the rehearsal would be called for three o'clock in the afternoon and Keith and Mick would finally get there about eight o'clock, literally, you know, and uh, yeah, then uh, they play for a few hours and they finally got it all together. And uh, that's one of the things about the Rolling Stones and, and about great bands, great bands, great bands just don't go on stage and it's perfect. There's this kind of frailty to a mm. great band. You can hear it coming together in front of your eyes or your ears kind of thing, you know what I mean? And and it's the same with the Stones. The Stones, you know, they start off and it definitely sounds a bit ragged, but you can hear everybody working hard to bring it together. That might not be so much the case nowadays, but it certainly was in those days uh, that, that it was human, you know. It was, uh, it was yeah, and it built to a crescendo and and... and yeah, some of the some of the earlier numbers in in a set would be a bit ragged, but so but surely, you know the the thanks to Charlie and Mick and and uh, and the Bill in many ways, you know the the rhythm section which was so solid, it would slowly build. Mick Taylor would grow in confidence. So by the end of that tour, yeah, they were playing brilliantly. 
you know, and then of course, then of course they went to Europe and did some stuff in Europe, and then they had eighteen months of not doing anything. You know what I mean? And that's all. But that's what the Stones do. They have long periods of inactivity. Sure. And then you know when they get back to going on the road again, then they've got to spend a lot of time getting it together and you know becoming as one, as it were. Now let's talk about the the Altamont debacle. Um, when do you first hear about the? Yeah, let's, let's call it what it is: the Grateful Dead's free gig at Altamont, not the Rolling Stones' free gig at Altamont. I've been telling people this for fucking fifty years. So, the, the, so how do you hear about this gig? How do you hear about it? I mean, what's your first inkling? Like, okay, we're going to be doing this. Would be great. Dead's going to be. Rock, Rock Scully came to London and was introduced to Keith by Mick, Mick uh, by um, Chesley Milliken, dear friend of mine, right, and brother of mine, who was the former uh, head of Epic Records Europe. Introduced him him to uh, to Mick. I mean, to Keith. Keith and Rock took acid. And they sat there and Rock told Keith about the dream of the Grateful Dead, which was to play a free concert in San Francisco with the Rolling Stones. That's when that first ever came up. And that was in 1968. The now, idea was When first. you heard that, you were like, oh, that sounds great. That sounds... That sounds yeah, like really, why not? That, that, we like the idea. I like the idea, sure. We've done, I've done lots of free concerts. The Rolling Stones did a free concert in London. Uh, all kinds of people did. The Floyd did, all of which I was involved with. Why not? All sounded good to me. <laughs> yeah. Great. So now this this now I have some clips from the Gimme Shelter movie here. This is this lawyer, right? This 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 guy. That uh, that prick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he's we see him. The fans first see here, you know, see him in this movie. Uh, this guy's kind of organizing it. Are you dealing with him uh, much or not really? Yeah. Mel Belli couldn't organise a piss-up in a fucking brewery. He was, he was a tort lawyer. He sued you for whatever you, you know, did that was wrong. He had, you know, he sued insurance companies on the part of victims. Right. He knew nothing whatsoever about rock and roll. The Rolling Stones went to Mel Belli, not me, right, the management of the Rolling Stones went to Mel Belli because Mel Belli was presented as the most heavily connected lawyer in San Francisco. He represented the mafia. Mm. Right. I went to see Mel Belli. I right, was told to go and see Mel Belli because he had a site, right, that this, this show could be done on. And so I went to see it. It was out near Court of Madeira, right? A couple of thousand acres, if not more, owned by the Knights of Columbus. Got it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was owned by them. It had one road going into it, which was basically a farm track. It wasn't a road. It wasn't a surface road or anything. And it was hills in the hills of Marin. Totally unsuitable. Right? So when I went back to Mel Belli to talk to him about it, right, I said, man, you can't put a rock and roll show on there. That's useless. Forget it, man. No way. There's no way you can access. People can't get in there. You can't drive cars in there. There's no way to park cars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He just basically dismissed me, you know. He refused to believe that it couldn't be done. He was, um, and at that point, the guy that owned Altamont called his office. And he was, you know, the guy that owned Altamont didn't have a fucking clue either, you know. But he saw, it, he saw it as a golden opportunity, you know, to put his place on the map, right? <laughs> and um, okay, so I was told, you know, I'd only been in San Francisco about four or five days, and it was, you know, it was all obviously chaotic. And uh, I was told uh, about Altamont being available, and that we needed to check it out. So this is exactly what happened. I sent Michael Lang the famous producer of Woodstock, right? Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> Rock Valley and Chip Monk, I sent them in a helicopter to look at Altamont. I never went there. Mm. They went there to look at it to see whether a show could be done there. They come back and said, yeah, we can do it. That's the three people who said that Altamont was a good place to do a show. 
I arrived on the Friday before the the day of the show, which is the Saturday. I was fucking horrified. So when you got there on the Friday, you knew this is going to be a sh- this is going to not be what I thought it was going to be. No, I didn't know that at all. I knew that the second I fucking arrived there and saw where they put the stage. They put the stage at the bottom of a hill. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Something we've learned at bitter cost in the music business. Is you don't put the stage at the bottom of a hill. You put the stage on the side of the hill or the top of the hill. Hello. <laughs> if you put it at the bottom of a hill, what happens is people push forward right that's why you have crowd barriers in stadiums and shit so people at the back don't crush the people in the front like yeah hello now as a tour manager though you did the hyde park so- show and you've done a lot on this tour so you know little things like this you would think that the the, the people from woodstock well, Wood, Woodstock was one of the worst organized fucking gigs in the history of the music business. And you know who saved Woodstock? The white rednecks that lived in all the towns around Woodstock who sent fucking food there. Yeah, not that's hippies, right. Not hippies. The hippies were all taking acid and rolling in the fucking mud. There wasn't any water, there wasn't any toilets, and there wasn't any food. There was barely any food, any fucking music because people were getting shocked by the fucking uh, power supply. Mm. It was a complete disaster. Yeah. That's a disaster. The only thing that saved it was everyone was on acid and didn't care. Oh, let's, take, remember it. Yeah. let's we'll take our clothes off and roll in the mud and have fun, right? But it was actually saved by local people who provided the food that fed those people at Woodstock because there was no food at Woodstock because the organisers couldn't have organised a piss up in a fucking brewery. And I know Michael Lang. I've known Michael Lang for, for fucking 50 years and he couldn't organ- He couldn't even organise the, the Woodstock Memorial concert. That's true. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, Michael's a good guy and he, he knows how to make babies. I'll give him that. He's got about nine kids. But other than that, yeah, really, please, give us a break. So, you know, organise it, you know. My mother used to say, anyone can attack Russia, but you better have a good plan. <laughs> yeah. Right. The essence, uh, the essence of all activities is a plan. When musicians play together, there's a plan involved. Right. It's called the structure of what it is that they're playing. You know what I mean? It's going to be in this chord. This is the chord progression. It's going to be in this key. These are the instruments. You know, this is the vocals. This is where the vocals come in. This is where this, you know, all things, all these things happen, sure. you know, right? Well, the same with concerts. So anyway, these three guys, theoretically, the three guys that really know, go and see Altamont and say, it's great. Right? Then Chipmunk, takes the stage that was built for the almost the top of a hill out at Sears Point and puts it at Altamont mm. and puts it at the bottom of a hill. It took me 40 years to get that man to accept the responsibility for that. <laughs> he did that. He did that. And he never stood up once to say it, and he hates me for saying it, and he hated me for pointing out that that was the fucking problem. That was the core problem. The grateful, the, the Hells Angels were not the problem. I was going to ask you, who brings them into the fold, the, Hel- the Hells Angels into the fold? Lots of and the Grateful Dead. Mm. Simple as that. But I've not, I mean, let, let's get to that in a second. Okay. The Hells Angels weren't the problem. The people weren't the problem. The Rolling Stones weren't the problem. There was one core problem for the whole fucking thing <coughs> was a stage that was barely, you know, a stage that was knee high that was put in the wrong place. Mm. That alone, if you'd had a fucking choir of angels on it, it wouldn't have mattered. That alone created the problems. Now, you can add to that shit drugs, sure. probably, probably distributed by, believe it or not, federal agents who were desperately trying to destroy the credibility 
of any rock and roll shows, major outdoor events, because one of the things at Woodstock that absolutely terrified him at Woodstock was a conjunction of interest between radical black groups and white hippies. And people were going around at Woodstock, right, with buckets collecting money for the Black Panthers. They, right. they, everyone forgets, man. America seems to have short memories. They killed Freddie Hampton, man. They shot him. The cops shot him 59 fucking times. In his mm. book, the leader of the Chicago Panthers, right? They shot him 59 times. He didn't even have a gun. He was stark bollock naked in bed. Did anyone say anything about it? Did they? Fuck. So they were killing the Panthers and people were raising money for the Panthers Defence Fund. There was the students for the Democratic Society. You don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Right? They were raising money for them as well. So the radical left was terrifying the people in power. Who was in power? Yeah, all of them. Yeah. yeah, and who was the fucking head of his of the uh, uh, his attorney general? That guy. Oof. Remember? Yeah, oh, yeah. I can't remember his name, but I know who I know who you mean. Yeah. yeah, terrible man, terrible man. So I'm, you know, I went around uh, um, uh, Altamont on the night before the show, late at night. I walked around with Rex Jackson, actually, bless him, who's dead now. A wonderful man, dear friend of mine, brother from the Grateful Dead. There were people handing out there, people with jars full of uh, tablets, acid, giving out acid, bad acid, man. It was bad. So I, it's in subsequent, subsequently, I knew and you know the three major acid myths on the West Bank. None of the acid that was distributed at Altamont was made by them. Mm. That's ours, Nick Sands, and someone who should be nameless. None of them made that acid. Mm. It was made by rogue elements. And the rogue element, in my opinion, was the Fed, some part of the feds that were determined to discredit large gatherings of young people. They were and very. The quantity, yeah. Sam, the quantity, the amount of those tablets, man, they were yeah. in like. Hundreds of thousands. They were handing yeah, out mayonnaise jars full of those yeah, things. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they, they had lots of it. I mean, super quantity. Yeah. Yeah, and the, of course, the, you know, we should remember that this is at the height of the Vietnam War. Right. You know what I mean? And people so readily forget that 1969 was not like you know 79, 89, 99, 2019. And it won't be like 2099. It was a unique, you know, each period has its unique kind of zeitgeist going sure. on. And this was a very, very, very dramatic period. Dramatic, dramatic, uh, you know, if politically and dramatic in a kind of aesthetic sense, you know. Great music came out of this era. Uh, yeah. the, the like of which, you know, maybe we haven't seen since. And it came out of that of, of that melting pot, you know. The American bands re-examined what it meant to be American mm. and came up with the, you know, the Orman Brothers, the band, Bob Dylan, the uh, the Grateful Dead, all, each in their own way um, reinvented the American musical dream and reinterpreted their their heritage, their musical heritage, you know, from from the the early folk music of the Americas onwards. So it was a very, between, I'd like, say, let's say, 68 and 75 was an amazingly productive period in uh, American cultural life. And, I mean, I feel very fortunate to have been a part of it. Even the bad bits. Even the bad bits were good. I should call, I should call my next book, book that. <laughs> That's pretty good. So you, you're, you're on the ground now, and it's Altima, it's day of... You have to know the, the stage is in the wrong place. The stage is too, you know, it's so small or whatever. Yeah. You have to know there's a million things that are wrong. And now you start seeing the, the bad assets out there. Then I'm going to show you a clip. This happened. <laughs> someone knocks Mick, Mick out, right? Someone punches Mick. So, him, yeah. 
that's so what now do you have to do you get notified that that's happened what is what is well, that coming from a helicopter i was on stage at the time he, he arrived in a helicopter and on the way to the stage somebody slapped him somebody attacked him and uh, yeah you know these things happen man you know well, he was shaken but he didn't you know he was very good about it he didn't want the guy hurt or nobody you know what i mean right no contribution or anything it's just one of those things you know it wasn't that wasn't the end of the world. There were much heavier things than Mick getting slapped, believe me. Right, right. That just was the, the, the kind yeah. of cold open to what's happening. Then yeah. people then people are on scaffolds and you have to make this announcement. The people that are hanging on that scaffolding, you're rendering that scaffold unsafe by climbing on it. Those scaffoldings are not built to take very heavy weights. So if we could have some sort of reason whatever that might be, we'd be very pleased. So now you're talking to people and getting them off the scaffold. Yeah, I mean, it was, look, you know, it's it's hard to convey to you mm. the, the general sense of horror from an English perspective at the way people were behaving. People in England don't behave, or they didn't used to anyway, the way that people in America behave, you know, in public. People, by and large, behave themselves as long as they're not, you know, fucking blind drunk or under the influence, which, of course, they are nowadays. But you know what I mean? In general, yeah. people kind of behave themselves. So people climbing on the trees and climbing up the scaffold and all that was really, you know what I mean, not helpful anyway. we You know, we tried to keep things calm and keep the show on the road. And, and, and of course, what happened was there's so much pressure, literal physical pressure, from the people at the back pushing forward, crushing the people on the, in the front. The people in the front have got nowhere to go to escape from the crush, except to basically get up on the stage, which they did. At some time, man, there was like 200 people on stage. It was just ridiculous. Right. Right. So, Constantly trying to, you know, clear the stage became an issue, and the only people who were vaguely together were the angels, you know, and they and the angels got fed up with it. They, you know, the angels aren't cops. You can say whatever you like about fucking hell's angels. Sure. They ain't cops. They ain't cops, man. You know what I mean? And so they tried the best they could, and they got fucking fed up with it. They didn't want to, you know, constantly throw people off stage. They didn't want to do nothing. They wanted to have a good time like everybody else. They like music. They like having fun. So, you know what I mean? They didn't want to be cast in that fucking role. No. And then, you know, there were people who got there who had no idea about Hell's Angels, had no idea about rock and roll. That not, that they weren't, you know, San Francisco people. The people at Altamont that came from all over America, let alone all over California, you know, and uh, most of the... the the California people that I know knew of or met subsequently from San Francisco, they all went on, they all went and sat on the side of the hill. Hmm. They didn't want to be right down in front, in front of the fucking stage. No fucking way. They'd be about up on the hill, they're having a picnic, whatever, staying cool, getting high, you know. Down the front was like young, young people from down the peninsula, you know, right. from, San, from San Jose, man. Yeah, so exactly. it's it's escalating here and now you know i mean at, this has got to be the worst day for a tour manager right i mean there, there's this there's nothing that you can do that's going to get anything back on track and here, i'll show you one more, i'll show you one more clip here do we yeah. want who wants to fight who is it? hey you know i mean like every other scene has been cool like like so I mean, what are you saying? What are you are you trying to tell Keith? Like, just I'm telling know. Keith, there's a guy out there with a gun. <laughs> so you got to be cool. I'll, shut up! I'll deal with it. So you knew that and that I was jumped off the stage and went down, and the guy was uh, dying. I had his blood all over my fucking over my sweater, and it was horrible. You know, it was a terrible thing, man. And um, you know. The guy has a gun, and then the, the Hell's Angels, you know, handle it obviously too extreme. Well, you don't pull a gun out in front of Hell's Angels. You're yeah. going to die. 
You know, don't pull a gun out in America in front of fucking anyone. You stand yeah. a good chance of dying. You know, someone's going to die. You know what I mean? And uh, so, yeah, um, the guy died. And uh, I mean, you know, when you think about it, yeah, it's dreadful. It was horrible, a horrible situation. But of course, there's been many, 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 many rock and roll shows, infinitely worse than Altamont. I mean, the Who did a show in Cleveland. Twelve people died. Right? Sure. There's there a fucking. Uh, there was a nightclub that got uh, set fire from indoor fireworks, and two hundred people died. Right. One person died at Altamont. Not that that makes it. You know what I mean? Any of the less right, not that it's horrible, okay. yeah. or tragic or okay, a shitload of people injured. Actually, four people died at Altamont, but one person was killed in, in a police. direct. Yeah you know, yeah. confrontation. The others were run over. Two were run over by a tractor uh, in their sleeping bags and one were, one drowned. But, um, yeah, it was a terrible day. It was a terrible day. The Grateful Dead um, always felt bad about it, you know, of course, you know. Uh, but, you know, it was partly their fuck-up. It was organised from their office in Nevada. Oh, yeah. So, you know what I mean? It wasn't a good day, not a good day to remember. Um yeah, the interesting thing is the only band that played uh, that where nothing happened was the Flying Burrito Brothers. When they played, everyone was cool. Yeah. Every, so, other, band, every other band played. If fucking fights were going off, all kinds of shit was happening. So you went, and then when the end of the movie shows everybody going to the helicopter, how did you deal with the out pop, You know, the outcome of Altamont after that? Do well, you they left. The Rolling Stones left America immediately, basically because they were terrified of being sued. And I had a last meeting with Mick. Oh, that helicopter landed. We went to the hotel. I had a meeting with Mick. I said, well, look, somebody's got to stay in America and deal with this. Mick said, oh, yeah. and I said, I'll do, I'll deal with it. You know what I mean? To a manager, man, when things go well, to a manager, just love to stand up and go, yeah, I, I organized that. I did this. I do that. When things go bad, you still got to stand up and deal with it. Somebody's yeah. got to deal with it. So I said, I'll deal with it. No problem. You know what I mean? The following day after Altamont, I went to a meeting with all the Hells Angels presidents of California. It wasn't a pleasant experience, but it had to be done. You know what I mean? And yeah. we, sorted, we sorted shit out. And I, they treated me with great respect. And um, of course, I'm grateful for that. Nobody fucking, you know, stabbed me, killed me, beat me up. They, they weren't for the lot. Given what had happened the day before, you know, the day before was not a good look for the for the hell's angels so that you you were you went into a threatened situation no yeah, it was very heavy but you know the, the hell's angels they like, don't give a fuck about what the look is <laughs> right you know, I mean? Hello. Yeah. you know what i mean the hell's angels have been pilloried and, and slandered and talked talk badly about you know ever since they first existed so you know they are aware of course of the implications of of, of that and um, and sometimes they try to micromanage, uh, you know, how how it how it's uh, how they're perceived and how they're looked at. But in the end, you know, you don't become a hell's angel. I mean, I don't know. I'm not a hell's angel. This is right. my opinion, right? Sure. But I'm pretty sure that in the end, you don't become a hell's angel because you give a flying fuck about what somebody thinks about you. You don't give a fuck about what exactly. people think. You, you you give you give a fuck about what your brothers think about you. You don't give a fuck about what society in general thinks yeah. about you, I'm sure, you know. But anyway, uh, they were good to me, man. They listened to me with great respect, uh, I think. You know what I mean? Uh, I interpret it as respect. I respected their position. Um, they wanted to see the film, you know, that they knew a film had been made so that the, so the, the guy's death would be on film. They asked me if I could get them the film. I didn't have the film, but I knew where it was. Sure. So I helped with that. You know, I helped them to call the people who had the film to get a hold of a copy of it. And ever since then, I've got to know members of the club and they've always been very kind to me. I've always been treated them with respect. It's a kind of mutual thing. And, uh, yeah, life goes on, you know. I mean, I'm not a big, bad bikey. I've never pretended to be one, although I had a motorcycle. Yeah, I've had several. And uh, love them, but I'm not. That's not my thing. Uh, if people want to do that, that's that's their business. America's the land of the free. You want to be a hell's angel? Sure. Yeah, do do it, man. You know. 
Yeah, they were good to me, and I don't have any issues with them. I don't think the Rolling Stones do either, actually. Right. I think by this point now, it's been so long, and I'm sure this, I'm sure the Stones have had other accidental deaths at their shows since then. Not not like this, you everything. know. Everything, man. Everything. Fuck, there's been riots, there's people being killed, there's all kinds. Of, everything you can imagine. The Grateful Dead had people killed at their fucking gigs by security in New right. Jersey. The Grateful yeah. Dead, of all people. Yeah, well, you know, that's because the Grateful Dead's management were a bunch of fucking dickheads who couldn't organise a piss up in a brewery. They didn't, <laughs> have, they didn't have a fucking anybody got killed when I looked after them, that's for fucking sure. And they certainly didn't have thuggish, you know, police-like, brutal, brutal security when I looked after them. No fucking way. When you compare the two, we started talking about Hyde Park. Yeah. Really amazing fucking yeah. event. Right, compared to this Altamont show, yeah. I think you could probably predict. Say when you got there and saw the stage and all this stuff, this might not be a great gig. But there's no way I think you could have predicted that that would have been what had happened. Right? How do you, I, yeah. yeah. Go on. Go on. I was going to ask you, uh, could you compare that, and how do you compare the two shows? I guess is what I was going to. Well, ask. I mean, you could, you know, if you wanted to be simplistic, you could say the high Park gig was a hashish gig. Sure. The uh, the the Altamont gig was a bad acid gig, mm. the, you know. So there's a radical difference right there for anybody who's got high in their life would know know you know the implications of that. One was a very peace and love, beautiful summer's day, wonderful thing, you know. The other was freezing fucking cold, December the sixth in the you know up in the in the high Sierras, you know, freezing with mm. you know um, and. Uh, in a completely inappropriate, totally wrong environment, laid out wrong with no facilities, no water, no toilets, nothing. You know what I mean? It was Fuck just a, a disaster waiting to happen. Um, so, uh, yeah, we live and we learn, don't we, if we're lucky enough to live. And so the music business learned a lot of things. You know, uh, the Rolling Stones learned that never to uh, ever do a gig ever again that they weren't totally in charge of. Totally. You have the planning and what happened, never again. The the Grateful Dead um, learned their lesson. So that, I mean, I did uh, Watkins Glen, organized Watkins Glen in 1973. We organized that specifically as a direct response to Altamont in order to show that large outdoor concerts were possible if they were planned properly, mm. if you had the right bands, you know, and yeah. if you had the right leading time, i.e. nine months. Yeah. I'm going to ask, ask you some a few questions from people that are here following yeah, us. You bet. You bet. Uh, Peter Mobbs wants to know, can you ask Sam what it was like seeing Graham and Keith uh, together and if you heard them play together? I'm sure you did. In I your did. Game. I heard them play together many times. With, uh, um, the Graham used to come and hang out all the time at, um, at uh, the house in the in um, in the canyon that uh, belonged to Stephen Stills that we were living in, and uh, it was lovely. He and uh, he and Keith had a, a an artistic bromance, I guess you could call it, and all they did was sit all day at the fucking grand piano, and uh, and uh, and uh, Graham would show Keith, you know, country music tunes, and I think there Keith learned. To genuinely love country music, the Rolling Stones. I mean, I think people sometimes think the Rolling Stones take the piss out of country music, but they don't. They loved it, you know. And, the, and I mean, it wasn't just Graham. You know, other people had their influence on the Rolling Stones, from Nicky Hopkins uh, up and down. You know, um, sure. but, but uh, Graham was particularly um, instrumental in getting them to see the benefits of country music, and and uh, the Stones went several times to see the Flying Burrito Brothers and loved them. And again, that was part and parcel of what I was saying about American musicians at that time period reinventing, you know, their approach to what it meant to be an American and to deal with American music. And that resulted in Crosby, Stills and Nash's albums. It resulted in Working Man's Dead and American Beauty from the Grateful Dead. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a very, very fecund and fertile period for music and yeah. it was lovely to watch uh, 
Graham. Graham was very beautiful, very special. We all thought he was an amazing guy in those years. Handsome, beautiful guy that ran around on a on a Harley in uh, in uh, L.A. He had a dream life. Karen wants to know, uh, 69 tour was the tour they met Muddy Waters in person for the first time. Do you recall that? Did that happen? Um, I wasn't at that. No, no, they met Muddy Waters long before that because they met him at the Chess Studios. Mm. So it would have been a couple of years at least in front of that. Brian was still with the band. Michael Watson says Sam's book. You can't always get what you want. Tells all the details. So there, there you go. There it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> Florida, a nice, uh, a nice plug there. Uh, now, you should say one thing here. You know, it doesn't say everything because, of course, you know, when you're a tour manager, man, it's a bit like working for the Queen of England. You don't get the job if you're somebody that's going to come on a program like this and tell the whole world what the colour of the Queen's underwear is. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. Sorry, you know what I mean. So there are. Of course, several things, many things, in fact, that I know about the Rolling Stones, I know about the Grateful Dead and other people, not not uh, Deborah, I should hasten to add here, <laughs> will, uh, will go to uh, go to my grave with me. You know, they're just, they're not for public consumption. So my book tells... I want, I want to plug Sam here. Sam, go ahead. Yeah. I'm kind of praising you and complimenting you. I was Sam's editor for two short stories. Got a chance to thank him, by the way, at the book launch party for the first anthology that he was in for not turfing me out on my ass from Madison Square Garden when I slapped somebody in the van because they came up behind me and grabbed my ass. I thought I was going to wind up in a dumpster. Fifty years later, I get to thank Sam, and he says to me, just as I introduce him to the bath, to the uh, to the the audience, and he starts reading before he starts reading from his wonderful short story Ibiza. I said, I, I got to thank him. I finally have the opportunity to thank him for not tossing me out of Madison Square Garden because he could have. This was in 69. And he said, well, frankly, darling, I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> that, uh, Sam, by the way, is a kick-ass writer. And from an editorial perspective, keeping in mind that I get paid a lot of money to edit people, Sam is, is almost a dream writer to work with. Because when you say to Sam, uh-uh, no, you can't make that part about you. That's not where you're going. You're in service to your story. Mm. I expected him to come back with what I call the yes, but response, which is always the defense. And he went, oh, thank God for editors. And I was, thank you. I didn't see that. Wonderful. Yeah, I, mean, I would edit him anytime, but not 700,000 words because I'm too old. All right, we got no. we got some more good questions here. Let me let me ask, let me pop these in. Jason wants to know if the whole Altamont show was filmed. I assume yeah. it was the documentary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. It's all on. Uh, Give me shelter is obviously an edited version. Yeah, you can't, you know, include it all. But yeah, it was filmed. Uh, Katie wants to know if you can talk about shows that were exciting and not problematic. My birth was exciting, as far as I know. <laughs> as far as I know, that wasn't uh, problematic. But who knows? <laughs> I know, you know what I mean? Um, there, there, yeah, there were lots of shows. Madison Square Gardens was great. You know what yeah. I mean? Boston was great. Get Your Yaya's Out still remains as one of the, the hottest uh, live albums that you could possibly uh, imagine in its own kind of funky, minimalist way. Uh, you know, they were great shows, of course. Yep. Yeah. Chicago was great. John John has a good, interesting question. Yeah. Did heroin damage the creativity, in Sam's opinion, after 69 for the next decade? Now, I don't know if he just means the Stones or from rock and roll in general, but I think that's a pretty good question. It's a great question. I mean... Just to let you know where I come from, I personally feel that heroin is the enemy. Mm. It's the enemy of consciousness. It, de it develops a certain form of consciousness, and it develops a certain forms of creativity. And there's no doubt that lots of people who have been junkies have been amazing writers, for example, and no doubt amazing musicians. It's a, for me, it's a matter of personal taste. I, it doesn't. It's not attractive to me. Other people want to do it. Look, I'm not in charge of other people's bodies. I'm not somebody that tells other people what they should put in their bodies. Each of us has a body. It's our own temple. We we deal with it as as we as we may. I think that after Exile on Main Street, the Rolling Stones' music deteriorated somewhat. Yeah, I, I think that Keith wasn't helped by his long struggle with heroin, but. Um, you know, he's such a, a marvellous uh, person. I um, will say this, that Keith Richards 
is a wonderful person. I'll tell you a little story about Keith. I said to my kids about five years ago, the Rolling Stones were coming to Australia. My kids were, what, 15 and 17, just finished in high school. I said, hey, the Rolling Stones are coming to Australia. You want to go? And my youngest, who's always been a bit cheeky, Chesley, looked at me and said, the Rolling Stones? Grandma likes the Rolling Stones. Cheeky bugger, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they both came. They both came to the gig. The Rolling Stones were sweetness personified. And Keith met them. I said, mm. Keith, you know, they're, they're both two hulking boys. My, both my sons are way bigger than you are, Pete. Big boys, right? Everybody looks at them and looks at me and goes, like, how did you make that? You know what I mean? They're so big. Anyway, uh, I said, Keith, this is, these are my sons. This is Chesley. This is Bodie. Keith looked at them and he goes, I want to tell you something. Right, pay attention, right? And they're both, you know, like stood at attention listening to We fucking love Sam, your dad, and you better fucking look after him, right? And then he gave him a big lecture about dads and how he looked after his dad and he loved his dad and he was lovely. And Keith's a, Keith's a wonderful man. He, uh, he, his public image is absolutely at odds with who he actually is as a person. He's a bibliophile. He actually owns a page of the Leonardo Codex. You know what that's worth? Mm. Seven, seven or eight million, one page of a book that's an original of Leonardo. He collects rare books and he's got an amazing library. He's a very sophisticated man. And he's been loyal in his life, I think, to three women mm -hmm. his whole life. He's been with his current wife, who's a lovely lady for, I don't know, 30, 35 years, got do two daughters with her, with, uh, with Anita for years, you know, um, which are, for which you should, you know, have several um, domestic Victoria crosses and uh, congressional medals of honour, you know, because she was a tough lady, but he loved her and he's a very loyal man. Keith, I, was, I can say one thing about Keith and Charlie, both of them, right? Neither one of them ever misbehaved on the whole tour that I was with. Mm. Never did. Very loyal to the the women in their lives, you know. Right. Special people. You can see it with both of them. It's for years. It's like everything that comes out of Keith's mouth, you say, okay, you know what? In classic New York parlance, that's a mensch. That is yeah. an absolute mensch, you know. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he, uh, yeah. Okay. He, he respects women. That's he true. And Charlie's been with his wife, I think, 52 years now. Charlie and Shirley have been married. Yeah. Back to more questions. Yes. Um, Christopher wants to know any reason why Mick was punched in the face after he got off the house. We talked a little bit about that, and there was no nothing behind it, I think, right? He just... No, just some random lunatic. <laughs> right, probably on that. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Karen wants to know about uh, the Rock and Roll Circus was funny. What about this? Do you have any comments on that? Well, I thought it was pretty sad, really. The music wasn't very good, was it? And it was like... It was a kind of a good idea, a relatively good idea, not very well um, executed. Yeah. And she just showed, you know, how, uh, what a loss the Rolling Stones were, really, creatively. Mm. Um, let me ask you uh, two, two more things here. What is your relationship? What was your relationship like with the Stones after this incident? Did you continue to do things for them or did this kind of seal the deal on that? No, no, and, that was the end of that, you know. But I mean, I've always been friends with Charlie. Charlie's always been very kind and, and Keith, and uh, we went our separate ways. But, you know, when they came to Australia, Ch Ch Charlie called me up. Mm. He said, "Yeah, hey, Sam is, is, you know, I don't know where he got my number from. I have no idea, but he got they, he got my number and he called me up. He said, oh, we're coming to Australia. We, you know, we'd love you to come to the gig, which was very sweet of him, you know. And uh, he thought I lived in Perth, but I actually lived in Brisbane. And, and he said, oh, well, we, we're going to play in Brisbane. Amazing, blah, 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 blah. So it was lovely to see him. I mean, the Rolling Stones have nothing to moan about with me. You know yeah, you're I mean? all good now at this point, though, right? Always. We've always been good. Yeah, I, I, all I wanted to do is pay me. Right? Yeah. No, now, did you, was that the gig? Was that the year that they toured with Mick Taylor? Did you get to see him reunite with them and all that stuff? No. Oh, well, what you out here? Yeah. When yeah you, Mick didn't. Yeah, Mick was at the gig. Yeah, he was amazing. Right. Right. It was so good to see him after all that time. No. 
Yeah, he was. Yeah, was fifty and counting. Fifty and counting. I was. I was at the San Jose show. Chuck got me. Chuck Lavelle got me. The, oh, it was lovely. You know, it was lovely. lovely. It was wonderful. Yeah, so, he's very good, and uh, I think it's very sad that he, you know, he didn't stay with the Stones. But Ronnie's great. You know, Ronnie's. Oh, a, sure. Yeah, Ronnie. You know, it all. Uh, who knows, man? Mick. Mick had a severe troubles with heroin. You know what I mean, man. Mm. Mick Taylor and just didn't, you know, and then he was upset about the way the Stones treated him. He didn't want to spend, you know, 20 years. I mean, Ronnie was prepared to be there for 20 years before he finally got accepted as being a full-on member, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mick Taylor felt that he wasn't being treated fairly. I don't know. Who knows, man? I wasn't privy to all that, but, uh, yeah. Ronnie yeah. says that he was at Hyde Park. Is that true? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, all right. Yeah, just watching it. Ray Road wants to know, uh, tell us a Jerry Garcia story. You, how you met him, maybe. You got any good Jerry Garcia stories? Well, I met Jerry uh, prior to um, prior to Altamont. At the first time I ever met Jerry, I met him at the Grateful Dead's office. He didn't say much. He was sitting there smoking a the joint. I thought he was pretty weird, to tell you the truth. <laughs> And then we started chatting a bit, you know, but I really got to know him immediately after Altamont because I didn't have anywhere to stay and he invited me to stay at his house, which was very sweet of him, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like, come in, he said, I'll give you shelter from the storm. And that's where I, you know, he and I became firm friends and we, you know, we just discovered a whole bunch of things that were amazing, like the fact that uh, both our grandmothers were called Tilly, which was mm -hmm. fun, you know, and my... Uh, my mother worked for a trade union. My adopt this is my adoptive family. My adoptive mother was uh, worked for a trade union, the first trade union in the Western world that got equal pay for men and women. And and uh, Garcia's grandmother was an organizer for the laundry workers union in San Francisco. So we both came from kind of similar backgrounds: um, left wing, progressive, trade union kind of parents. You know what I mean? Or parenting that environment. My mother was a communist. I mean, not that I'm any near being a communist. Um, I'm way to the left of communism. Um, but, um, yeah, so we had something in common. And, of course, you know, uh, immediately well, when Altamont had just happened, uh, Lenny Hart, the Reverend Lenny Hart, that good <laughs> Christian general, had just run off with the $350,000 worth of the Great for Dead's money. Uh, so that was the manager ran off with 350000 and a 22-year-old girl from the bank that handled the accounts. And such was his, uh, his uh, brilliant imagination. They ran away to a seedy motel in San Diego on the beachfront. I mean, hello, you know what I mean? <laughs> I tell you what, acid, acid is wasted on some people. Karen wants to know any stories about Bill. She means Bill Wyman, and I think that will be... Boring, boring Bill that we used to call him. <laughs> <laughs> I've never known a man bonk more women in my life than Bill Wyman. Well, <laughs> I knew he was bonking them. Put it like this. We used to call him 10-minute Bill. <laughs> we go for another one. There'd be all these girls outside the hotel, and Bill would just, yeah, oh, uh, Sam, see that girl in the blue coat there? Go, get her to come and have a drink. I go, Bill, come on, man. I mean, you know, I'm busy. No, no, no. Do, you know, go on. All right, so, yeah, he was – insatiable our uh, bill and uh, he had it he had great fun yeah, bless him we could do this all night but we'll let you on, end on this one uh can sam tell us about janice well janice was beautiful she was a lovely woman man. and because uh, <laughs> when i lived with jerry in um in larkspur in california um marine county uh I think it was the second day I was there. I went for a walk down the street. It was this lovely street with all redwoods in it. Very pretty, you know. Uh, what was it called? Ladrone Driver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, I walked down the street and I saw Janice's... Um, um, oh, fuck, come on. I'm having an old time this moment here. This painted <laughs> car of hers, right? Beautiful. Uh, a Porsche. Yeah. All painted, hand-painted Porsche. I went, that's Janice's car. That's weird. And it was parked. It just was parked so it looked like it belonged to the person whose house it was. So I just went up and knocked on the door. And Janet opened the door and went, Sam Cutler, Janet. Oh, well, I'm just telling the door, big hugs all around, you know. And, uh, yeah, so 
for a few months there, we became firm friends, you know, and I used to visit her every day and all that. And she used to cry on my shoulder and uh, she was very beautiful and everybody loved her, man. And uh, again, another tragedy, man, you know, I mean, another tragedy. Somebody who mixed heroin with fucking alcohol, you know what I mean, man? A lot of people died, man. For, from uh, taking the wrong drugs at the wrong time. So I now have had five five cancers and four wives. Um, yeah, I you know, I don't really take drugs anymore. Well, I take drugs for, to suppress uh, cancer, uh, but yeah. I don't take um, psychedelics or anything very much once a year maybe, you know, and mm. I certainly don't smoke anything because I've only got half a lung from lung cancer. Um, but I've still got lips, so I still kiss. <laughs> nice man. Thank you. It's been nice to talk to you and to Yeah, Deborah. man. I appreciate you so much oh, coming on. Deborah, you as well. Deborah, do you wanna is there any music that people can get uh right now of uh, by you that you oh, know send some oh, people? Yeah. Well, the first our first our first C D was called The Bucket List for obvious reasons. And Sam will appreciate this. I went full circle on liner notes. I mean, I learned who a lot of people were because my father would show me liner notes. He was a musician. He'd go, look at this, check this out. Oh, it's Carlos Santana, blah, blah, blah. Um, and as packaging for these things got smaller, we went from LPs. Remember, Sam, where you could pull out the sheet inside and there'd be like, you know, Charles Shaw Murray would have written, you know, two people, you know, literally a half a book on, on what was going on in the album. And they were amazing. Liner notes were fucking brilliant. And the packaging got smaller. It was cassettes and CDs and, mm. and couldn't. And I just realized with our first CD that we went full circle. The net is boundless. I had no constraints. So I gave, and the epic was the, the liner notes for the new one, which is called This Moment of the Storm, which is due out momentarily, probably within the next month, um, are, are just going to be beyond epic. You have no constraints. You can you can give the full story for every song. Mm. Back up. The fact that on the first on the first album, uh, the first CD, I'm, I'm sorry, in my head, in my head, they're records. Everything's an album. They're, they're right. recordings of a story. That's what they are. And uh, the first one is called the Bucket List. And if you go to SoundfieldBand, that's one word, dot com, and you click on liner, liner notes, buckle in. Cool. Every, you know, it's just have a, have a good read. The second one is coming out shortly, but yeah. Um, the band is called Soundfield. There's a lot of it up on YouTube. The oh. first one was called The Bucket List. Second one is called This Moment of the Storm. It's a Rogers Elasney title because that's where we are, isn't it? Yeah. We're frozen in this moment of this storm, looking yeah. at what we're doing and who our, who our surrounding families are and our extended families. Yeah. It's one of those moments where we have to learn who we love, why do we love, and how can we take care of each other. And for and for, for for Sam, what about your book, man? How can people? Is that on Amazon, and everybody can get it there? Oh yeah, you can get it. It's published. It's, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it from the publishers or in Toronto. Um, uh, you can even get my new book, which is called "Please Die Quietly and Don't Make a Mess." It's a, <laughs> a cancer memoir. You'll you'll love it. It's great fun. I'm only kidding. No, everything's good. We're not promoting anything here except Pete Fierro. Thank you. Much appreciated. Yeah. Man. It's yeah. all good, lovely being with you. Lovely yeah. being with you, Deb. And uh, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks so much for sharing everybody. your stories, man. Much appreciated. Everybody yeah. seems to love it here on the on the. Yeah, love to everybody out there. Nice. All right, man. Bye. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Later. Bye. Till the next goodbye. Bye, Bye guys.